I remember seeing my professor's car one day. I pull in, and he was, like, driving this old beat-up car. And uh, I remember just, like, raising my hand and asking him, like, hey, why don't you do this stuff? You know, I just saw your car. And he kicked me out of class. And I just decided, like, why am I, why am I listening to a guy who has a life that I don't want? All right, welcome back to Origin Stories. Um, I tell people we talk about life, business, real estate, and today we got a special guest. We're going to cover all those at a high level. I'm stoked for this this episode. This is it's going to blow your minds. Um, and this man, his name is Jeff Fieldstead. So, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, dude. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. G- genuinely excited. He has his own podcast yeah. himself, so he's a vet when it comes to this. It's called Solid. Yeah, I don't know about a vet, but we've been doing it for a couple of years, so it's been fun, man. So shout out to that. Go follow Jeff's podcast. You'll want to after this uh, this episode. Um, yeah, Jeff, I'm I man, I'm excited. There's going to be a lot to learn for for the the listeners to learn here. The first thing when I think of Jeff Fieldstead is high school. That's so if, so, if someone <laughs> if someone because went to Snow Canyon High School, yeah. if someone knew Jeff in high school. What did they think of Jeff? I don't know. That's I would like to. Like, I hear what, all different. What do you What do you think? Dude. What do you think I thought as a young buck of Jeff Fieldstead? I don't know, man. I think when I was in high school, when I was in junior high, I got a ton of fights. That's what but I then, thought of. By dude. the time I got to high school, I didn't really get in a lot of fights anymore. I mean, I was a boxer, but yeah, I was an honorary kid for sure. You were you were just so swaggy and confident and <laughs> a boxer. So anyway, I just because your sister's my age and. And anyway, I'm like, man, this guy is intimidating, you know? Yeah. It's funny, dude. I think, yeah, I mean, thinking back to high school and junior high and all those times I did, I got in so many fights, man. But I think a lot of that, I don't know, dude. I was just ornery, low self-esteem, you know? Yeah. So you kind of try to make up with being aggressive. <laughs> but I think it helped me. I actually think it helped me later on in life. It's funny because I have three kids and one of my sons is – a lot like that. My wife's like, it's your fault. You know, I'm like, <laughs> stems from you. He, yeah. He's never like seen that side of me really, but he's just the same. And, um, I always tell him if you can just learn to channel that feeling, I think it, it helps with awesome. success. So know? cool. Yeah. So my little brother was just in here and he asked you, he said, so what do you do for work? Yeah. <laughs> what was your answer? Kind of semi-retired. That's pretty cool. Yeah. How old are you? Yeah, it's um, 38. 38, yeah. semi-retired. So so my, sold my business three years ago at 35. <clears throat> yeah, so let's jump into that. I uh, I remember I was following you, dude, and I start seeing you posting awards and yeah, and just crushing. Yeah. And you did Prime, Prime America, yep. which is financial services. Correct. So when... Yeah, and I don't know this story. I'm excited to hear it because I know you crushed it. We'll, we'll jump into that. Um, but yeah, I know you took a you took a pretty big leap where you moved away. Yeah, you got married at a semi young age. Yeah, I was 21. Kelsey yeah. was 19 when we yeah. got married. And um, yeah, man, I started in financial services. I was 20, just turning. Yeah, so I was 20. And uh, what'd you do right after high school for a couple of years? Advertising. Okay. So Kelsey's mom owned a company called Action Zone. It was actually Sandstone Publishing, but we did, you know, there was a magazine that was big around town called Action Zone. And then we had cool. another magazine called the Real Estate Buyer's Guide, which this was before Zillow, you know, so you couldn't, the way you would go look at a house was so like a buyer's guide. You grab a hard, right? hard copy. Yeah, it's funny. That's so funny. did those things, did advertising, did uh, commercials on TV, radio ads stuff like that, and then went straight from that to Primerica to do financial services. What was your breakthrough? Because you, I mean, sounds like you caught the vision at Primerica of yeah. what the possibilities were. And I love it because it's so similar to a lot of sales jobs Yeah, where you can look at people within the company and what do you see the top dogs? I mean, they're making, I'm sure at Primerica, they were. Oh, I mean. You, you looked at them and realized they're. Yeah, I mean, they're, I they're doing it. Started meeting guys that were worth hundreds of millions of dollars, you know. And I mean, I didn't, when growing up, I didn't have any money. I, we were poor, you know. And so I always wanted to be successful financially. And I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. But I was going to school at Dixie. So I went to school for like two weeks, dude. And um, graduated high school, started Dixie. And this is all while I'm doing advertising. But I think I'm going to go get a degree. And, you know, I, I don't know route. exactly what I'm yeah. going to do. But um, 
I remember seeing my professor's car one day. I pull in, and he was, like, driving this old beat-up car. And I was, like, a quiet guy in school. It wasn't like I ever talked in class. I was never, like, the guy sitting on the front row. And uh, I remember just, like, raising my hand and asking him, like, hey, why don't you do this stuff? You know, I just saw your car. Which, knowing now, I'm like, it was kind of a dumb thing to say. But when yeah. you're young, you, like, look at what people drive. And that it's it has nothing to do with the relativity of how much success they've had. But that's what I thought. Yeah. And so I just said, why don't you do this? And he kicked me out of class. And I was just I was like, why am I, why am I listening to a guy who has a life that I don't want? And so I think that was kind of like the first realization of leadership and sales and trying to pay attention to what people's lives look like is that moment is he kicked me out of class. And I just realized like, here I am listening to this guy that everybody told me I should do, right? Everybody yeah. told me, go to school, get good grades, go to college, get an education. Probably and teaching business or some. I was in a business form. class, yeah. yeah. And he's yeah preaching and, business and anyway, but yeah, keep going. Yeah, and I don't great principle in general. Did, yeah, he didn't own a business, you yeah. know. And I don't know why it just clicked all of a sudden at that moment and asked him the question. But I think his response is what made it so like, you know, it's like someone pushes you, you naturally want to push back. And so his response to me kind of made me feel like you know I was a fighter, man. It was like, oh yeah. You know, if you're going to kick me out of class, I'm never coming back. Like, if I leave, I'm not, I'm not coming back and going to listen to you. So when I left there, I just started thinking differently. And then this guy had prospected me, asked me if I was open to making more money. And, of course, like, who's not, right? I always want to make some more money. And then he invites me down to his office, and I went to this meeting. You know, I go to this meeting and see all these guys making all this money, but I didn't think I could do it. I believed him. But I'm like, there's no way, you know, I, there's no way I could do this. Like yeah. sales, talking to people, asking questions, all this stuff. There's no way I could do it. So for a year, the guy that invited me to that meeting followed up. And then finally I went back because in advertising, my pay got cut. So I started doing good, man. And we'll go into that. In, in advertising, I, I went to uh, a guy named Tom Hawkins, who's a big sales trainer. And so I started learning these sales skills, which I think are cool. powerful. And so I started doing good in advertising, but then they cut my pay. So I'm like, dang, you know? So then I'm not kidding the same day, 20 minutes after my pay got cut in advertising, this guy followed up with me, Brandon Nail, who I do the podcast with. <laughs> He's such a good guy. Which is shows you the power of follow up, right? Yep. Like how many people ever follow up? Like rarely do people follow up. I say it all the time, like I'm buying cars or real estate or something like that. And I probably would have bought something if they would have just called me back, you know? And they just never followed up. But Brandon did. He followed up 20 Great. minutes later after I got my pay cut, just said, how's life? He invites me back down to his office, and I take Kelsey this time. And Kelsey was, like, super motivated, you know. And she was uh, going to school. She was still in high school, but she was working at Best Buy full time. And she wanted to be a commercial pilot, so she was also trying to get her pilot's license. She would fly every day, That's too. That's crazy. That's cool. Know, interesting, huh? And... um so I take her down to this meeting and like halfway through she elbows me and she's like, why aren't you doing this? And I'm like, it's way harder than it looks, you know, which is true. I think a lot of times people, they see things and they want it to be good. And so they have this perspective of like, oh, it's going to be easy. But yeah. I knew like in order to be successful in anything, it's going to be hard, you know? And she goes, who cares? Like Brandon at the time he was making 30 grand a month and this was in 2006, it's a lot of money, you know? <laughs> and she goes, do you know how long I have to work to make $30,000? He made that last month. I've got to work for like three years. Yeah. She goes, I don't care how hard it is. You should do this. And she couldn't because she was 17. You got to get a state uh, state license. So I'm like, all right, I guess, you know, what I have to lose? I'll try it. Yeah. So that was kind of the beginning of the journey, man. I love that you said two things that I think resonate when people look into an opportunity like this, whether it's sales or something scary. The first thing you said is, ah, I don't think, I don't know if I can do it. Yep. Right? Which yeah. everyone had, like, majority of people have that, especially yeah. if you don't have experience. And then the second thing you said is, it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's hard. It's, it is. It's probably way harder than it looks. Like, he just, and there's truth there. Yeah. Right? And, and you nailed it in saying, like, anything of a great reward, it ain't, I mean, shouldn't come easy. Yeah, anything worth having is is should be hard. Yeah. You know, I always say if winning was easy, losers would do it. And it's just not easy. Winning is not easy. That's good. It's hard. It takes a lot of work. It challenges everything about you, you know. And so I kind of knew those things up front yeah. from sports. 
You know, good. it's like to win, you got to work hard. And it's always the things that people don't see that cause you to win when everybody is watching. But it was, you know, if you're in the gym late nights, if you're working out when nobody's around, and then then you got to fight and there's a crowd around and you win. You didn't win in front of that crowd. You actually won when nobody was around. And I knew that, like going into business. Great. And so, you know, I think a lot of that goes back to like self-esteem. I, I used to use this analogy. You know, it's like before I ever made any money or before anybody makes money, they'll like, you know, like let's say their friend has a Ferrari and they throw them the keys and they go, hey, take it for a drive. Uh, somebody who has a lot of self-doubt or a low self-esteem, they'll look at it and go, oh my gosh, I don't want to wreck it. Don't touch anything. Don't break it. Drive slow. And they're nervous, right? And a lot of it just has to do with their their self-esteem, their value in themselves. But if you take someone that has a high self-esteem and maybe they've owned exotic cars before, they've had a lot of success, and someone says, hey, take it for a drive, what do they do? They hop in. They're freaking snagging that key. Yeah, I wonder how fast it they're goes. Like, right. Right? They're yeah. pushing it a little bit. Exactly, and yeah. they feel confident. And it could be the exact same person with just a different perspective. And I think a lot of that happens with people when they see an opportunity. Like, can I do this? Of course you can do it. The question is, do you believe that you can do it? And so overcoming that belief for me was the important thing, like going into sales or something like financial services. You know, I was 20 years old. Like, I never shaved my face. Who's going to listen to me? And people would say that. Like, I'm 45. Why should I listen to you? You're 20 years old. You, you don't have a college education. Why should I listen to you about money? And then I had to learn, like, look, if you if you have a car and you take it to the dealership to go get fixed, do you ask how old the mechanic is? No, you don't care as long as it gets fixed, yeah. right? As long as they do a good job and fix the vehicle, that's all that matters. And so I learned that with financial services. As long as I was good at what I did, as long as I knew what I was doing and I could help this person, it didn't matter how old I was. What mattered was, did I have good skills? That's so good. And so that's, I think, how a lot of times you overcome belief is you start raising your skill level which your competence, and then it starts making you feel confident, like, dang, I can do this. You know, you get, you make a sale, you make a little bit of money, you go, dang, I can that, do this. No, I love asking that question because self belief is, I mean, that's where everything stems from. Everything. You got to, you got to believe. Yeah. You got to have a little belief in there that you can do it. Yeah, and, and you just touched on it, like you got to start doing things to develop that skill set of whatever it is to to get the belief, your belief system going. What would you say are some things, and like I said, it's kind of an open-ended question, but what are some things that some people could do to become more confident? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is, like, if it's, it depends on what it's in, like in yeah, sales. exactly. Like it could be sales, sales, could be right? being a mechanic. I mean, there's a lot of different things, but yeah, yeah let's, let's talk about sales. I think if it's sales, you got to, whatever industry you're in, you got to, you got to develop some skill sets because a lot of people, they're trying to like, they'll try to close sales and they just go, oh, it's a numbers game and they just work the numbers without ever actually having an intention to get better along the process. It'd be like this. If you're going to go golf, right, and you go to the golfing range or the driving range and you get a club and you get your driver driver out, you start smacking balls, and all of a sudden you keep slicing it and slicing it. make this is where a coach comes in a lot of time a mentor someone that can help teach you so you get a mentor or a coach somebody who's been there before somebody who's a little bit better and they can say hey change your grip change your stance do this and then boom you smack it and then all of a sudden now it's going straight down the middle now you can hit it a thousand balls and now you get really good at doing it right so the difference is a lot of people come into sales and they go i'm just going to work really really yeah. hard without an intention of actually trying to develop a skill set and so they beat their heads against the wall. And I think that actually does the opposite effect of build belief. It actually builds this negative self-doubt uh, uh, pattern. Yeah. Where they're like, man, maybe I'm not good enough. See, I did as many appointments as this guy did, and I didn't close, he did, or whatever. And then they start this comparison thing and going, see, he's better than me. And I can't he's not. do this. Yeah, yeah, he's not better. You just But he doesn't see him calling his coach and saying, hey, here's what they said. Here's what I said. What should I do? You know, And developing those skill sets. So I think the first thing in sales is like, all right, learning those skills. And a lot of it has to do with going to a coach or a mentor or somebody who's been there before. Yeah. With my, with my job, that we go door to door selling pest control yep. and we have people, same thing. Like I went and pounded the same amount of doors. I am saying the exact same thing. He, they all say, mm -hmm. I'm saying the exact same thing he is like, yeah. how come I'm not getting sales? And yeah. I always ask, I'll be like, Hey, how, how many of you guys throughout the day wrote down where you think you could improve or what went wrong in different scenarios? Right. And how many raise their hands? Not many, that right. often. Almost never, right? But also, and they could be saying the same things, 
But just because you said the same thing doesn't mean you said it with the same amount of energy, the same amount of passion, the yep. same amount of assumptive, like, hey, this is going to work for me. And this is where perspective and optimism comes into play, right? Where if you assume something's going to happen, a lot of time that's what's going to happen in your life. Yep. So if you, you know, maybe you did say the same thing and maybe you did knock the same amount of doors, but did you have the same kind of attitude? Did you have the same amount of passion? Did you assume that everybody was going to move forward with you? Because people can feel those things. Those are, it's, it's body language. And I think yeah, 80% yeah. of sales is body language, is body language not the things we say out of our mouth. Nonverbal, paraverbal, the, the words don't matter yeah. as much. You could teach a parrot how to you talk, yeah. right? <laughs> but that doesn't mean yeah. they're going to get good at sales. Yeah. So I think it's important for people to understand when they go into sales, it's like you also have to have the passion and energy, which I also do think comes from self-esteem. Yep. And I think a lot of times, not only does it come from, hey, develop these skills, but it's also your expectations. We kind of talked about this before the podcast. It's like, do you expect that you deserve more? Do you expect that you should have more success? Do you expect that you should be closing more sales? You know, I think um, someone was telling me a story recently that I didn't know Roger Bannister when he broke the four-minute mile. I mean, it took, what, thousands of years for someone to break the four-minute mile, and it was impossible. But he didn't even run. Someone told me he was a scientist. I don't know if this is true. No, we can look it no up. No way. But he wasn't like a runner. And then he breaks it, and then boom, right after Everyone's how many people? Breaking it. Yeah. And he was just doing it to prove it wrong that it was all in our mind, right? It, that our body was cap capable, but what was stopping people was our mind. And so I think a lot of the success goes to that, where I ask people, like, do you think you should win? Because if you think you should, you probably will. And you look at all these stories, man, of people that succeeded. You know, you got a picture of Kobe right here or anybody in the world that has succeeded big time. You can go back early on in their careers, and if they have recordings of themselves, they're telling people they're going to win far before they did, you know? Dude, that question's sick. Do you yeah. think you should win? Yeah, do you think you deserve to win? So good. Because yeah. then you just start to self-reflect on, yeah. like, what if the answer is yes, like, okay, why? Yeah. And a lot of people will say, well, shoot. I don't know. Exactly. And then and they'll then start you don't, thinking, why not? Yeah, exactly. Then yeah. they'll start thinking like, okay, like, yeah, this is, I probably shouldn't win because I'm not doing X, Y, Z. Exactly. That's good. And man. that's where I think, you know, there's like all these popular routines on social media right now. People all do this routine, which by the way, I think are good, but they're a bunch of BS. They don't cause success, right? What causes success is being obsessed about being successful in that thing. Your routine yeah. isn't going to make you successful. However, a lot of successful people do have routines and I think the reason why is they build confidence. So if you have this routine like, hey, I'm going to go to the gym every day. You paid a price. You go, I did what I said I was going to do. Start stacking wins. Alex yeah. Mosey said it best. Exactly. Like and I love that quote that he said. He's like, shout in front of a mirror. It's true. That ain't it. But if you go and you you start stacking yep. wins and do what you say you're going to do. Yep. That's the stack of, of proof. It's what builds character. Yep. Because if you, you know, I always tell everybody, it's like if you take this round hole and you take a square peg and you shove that square peg into a round hole, it doesn't fit. But you turn it enough times and eventually it's not You'll square it anymore. Fit. Right? And so this is the problem with not going to the gym or not making that sales call or not knocking enough doors or whatever it may be, whatever somebody said they were going to do and then they don't do. It's like, it's like knocking the edges off of that square peg. It's like telling yourself, Hey, maybe you're not quite good enough. Maybe you're not strong as you thought you were. So it's important. I think for people to say, Hey, however small you want to start those goals, I think it's a mistake to start small. I think you should, you know, believe big and go for something big. I think the biggest mistake I made is not having bigger goals. Cause I couldn't see that far, but at the same time, it, it's like, you want to have these goals that when you set them, you accomplish them so you feel good about yourself. Yeah. So, hey, I did what I said I'm going to do. It's good. You know? So you, I mean, if you're watching this, you can see why Jeff crushed his job. Yeah. So you you start out on this path yeah. and Primerica, I mean, that's financial services. Yeah. That is just pounding the stone. You're just yeah. having to go out and generate business. Yeah. Every client. Like, that's recruit, just straight hustling. Everything. Yeah. Like, you're recruiting, you're and selling. Have, there was no social media either, so it wasn't like I could send somebody a message. I had to go out and shake hands, man. That's old school. Yeah. So you build this sucker up. You become pretty relevant within the company. Yeah, definitely. And then I mean, you we, sold your book. Yeah. we. I mean, we we became, you know, there's like a, the biggest title in the company is senior national sales director. And then another giant one is national sales director. We became the youngest national sales directors in the company's history. You know, they've been around for 47 years, I think. Yeah. So 
we did a lot of cool things and it wasn't just us. I mean, there was a lot of people who helped us do those things, but yeah, it started with just us, man. It started with a vision, just like, Hey, what, what if we could really make this thing happen? You yeah. Know, with some faith. I love your story in when I, not your story, but you've talked about it a lot in your podcast, how Kelsey played a role yeah. in the vision mm-hmm. and being on the same page and communicating the sacrifice yeah. per se of, of what it's going to take, you know, giving up what you want most for, you know, what you want now yep. like, and, and going out and doing it. So let's speak to that, like her role in, and you communicating. Yeah. Well, I think honestly, I did a horrible job communicating at the beginning. Now I would have zero success if it wasn't for her. And I think this is important in partnership, like anybody who's married or they have a spouse. I think the most important decision other than the decision you make to follow Christ is going to be who you choose as a spouse. Because there were times where I was up and she was down and I was the one that helped her get excited again and then vice versa. When I was down, didn't think I could do it. She would remind me, you know? And so I think a lot of times when you see, you'll see people who've had a lot of success for a lot of years and then they start having personal problems and then they're whatever, whether it's sports or business is just not the same. And it's just hard because it takes up mental energy. And in order to be successful, I think you have to be obsessed about something to be successful. And this is why it happens sometimes. And it's a it's a hard thing to juggle. Yeah. So early on in our in our uh, journey to success, I did a horrible job of communicating it. In fact, so when we started, you know, prior I was working for her mom doing advertising. So we spent a lot of time together. I would always see her every day, all day. She can come see me at the office anytime. But then when I started in financial services, it was like I was on appointments, man. I was out shaking hands, prospecting, setting appointments, doing appointments. She's not seeing you. Never. Yeah. Like I would get I would I would get done like at 10 o'clock because I would usually do my goal was to be on a six o'clock and eight o'clock appointment every night. So I'll get, you know, that's when people are home. So during the day I would prospect. Prime, yeah, it's prime time at night. Yep. And then at night I would do appointments. And so we always had the saying recruit by day and sell by night, right? And so I would do a six o'clock and eight o'clock at night. And then I would get done about 10 o'clock or 1030 with my appointment and I would go see her. So here it was 1030, 11 o'clock at night. I got an hour or so and I would see her, say hi, and then go home. And she wasn't happy about it. She was mad. And so originally what happened was I just wanted to win, man. And so she's the one who got me started and I did a horrible job of communicating. I got offended that she was like mad I was working so much. And so I was just like, well, then let's not do this then. Let's just break up and act like I go on a mission. You know, all my other friends went on a mission for two years. So just act like I went on a mission. And (laughs) in two years from now, we'll see if we can make it work. I love this because this is so common. It is, man. With with most... Like, cause you talk about obsession. Most people get obsessed and yeah. no, this and then, is what, this is what happens. Yeah. And then they make dumb decisions and I did too. And so, but the good thing is if you have a good mentor, you have a good coach, you have somebody that you run things by someone you trust. So I actually went to Brandon Neal and we talked about this on podcast. So I said something to Brandon and he goes, dude, it doesn't work that way. And he goes, if she doesn't help you make it, she'll never feel confident with helping you spend it right. Or live this life. It's just never going to work. You want her around. You need her. And so I'm like, all right, dude, what do I do? And so Lexi, Brandon's wife, actually sent Kelsey flowers from me, but I didn't know. So then Kelsey called me, hey, you know, whatever. So I just said, hey, I'm sorry. I need you. Like, I'm sorry I didn't communicate it right, but I need you. Like, in order to win, I need you. I need your support. I need to know while I'm out working hard, I'm doing this for you, not in spite of you. I'm doing it for you. Like, I want to win. I want us to have a great great life. And so... She's like, well, what do you need? And I'm like, I just need you, number one, just to support me. Like, just be there. Know that when I get done for the day that you're just my biggest cheerleader. And then number two, just I want you involved. I don't want you just to be a spectator. I want you to be involved. So if we have a meeting, I want you to come with me. And still today, like, dude, she, I tell people all the time, my wife can't come. I don't want to be there, you know? I want her there because I, I like to run things by her. So I like to, her to know how did the meeting feel? If we're doing a real estate deal, how'd you feel about this person? How did it go? And so I can yeah. run it by her because she catches things I don't catch. Yeah. And so still today, that's kind of how it is. And so she just started plugging in. And then eventually when we moved from St. George to Boise, she did everything I didn't do. So that was kind of our thing. Like, all right, I'm going to do the things that grow the business and that we can make money from. And she said, I'll do everything else. So it didn't matter what it was, dude. If it was taking out the trash or going to get the- Straight teamwork. Yeah, going to get the oil change in the car, whatever it was, 
she didn't care. She was like, I'll mow the lawn if that's what it takes so you can be freed up to do the things that we can go build a business so we can get free one day. I'll do whatever it takes. And she, one day she told me it was powerful. She said, I promise you that at the end of this, you'll always be able to say that I was a reason it happened, not a reason it didn't, right? And so oh, whatever it takes. And I think a lot of times we just don't that's communicate good. what we need from our spouses to, to be able to chase success and, and chase the dream, you know? Yeah. Communication is huge. Yeah. And so many fall. I mean, I work with so many couples that they love the job. They become obsessed mm -hmm. and they don't communicate. Yeah. They don't get on the same, they don't, they don't have the same vision. They don't get on the same page. Yeah. And next thing you know, it, I mean, just how you're started, but mm -hmm. you ended up, shout out to Brandon. Yeah, for real. That's the power of a good coach. Like, yeah, see that? Like, series. shout out to Brandon. Yeah. That's cool. So you exit, you end up building an awesome book. Mm -hmm. Your organization grows big. Yeah. You sell three years ago. Yeah. And I heard you say it multiple times, and I know you talk about it a lot, but I, I know what, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what really pushed you, it sounds like freedom. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the name of our team, we called ourselves Team Freedom. I was like, I've never, I like nice things, dude, and I've had a lot of nice things, but what drove me was the ability to do what I want when I want without ever having to look at what it costs. You know, it's funny to me because it's always like broke people are always telling you money isn't everything, but then that's all they think about. Yeah. It's like I actually wanted to get to a place where I never had to think about money. So I wanted to get so wealthy. I wanted to get so I could travel as long as I wanted. If we, you know, my wife and I, we just got back from the Bahamas. I'm like if I wanted to stay another two weeks, we could. You know, if we wanted to go live there for six months, we could. If we wanted to go wherever, we could do whatever we wanted to do. And that was really my goal is to be able to do what I want when I want. And so, yeah, I thought about it a lot, man. So, And then as building our business, what helped me was I always thought about not just making money so I'd grow my income, but the reason I was growing my income is so I could invest more money, not necessarily, not necessarily so I could increase my lifestyle. So I always lived on this philosophy where I lived on a percentage of my income, which was usually pretty small, like 10% of my income nice. I would live on, and then I would invest the rest. So the only way I could increase my lifestyle was to grow my income because I lived on this percentage. Just because I had more money doesn't mean I could increase my lifestyle. I actually had to grow my income in order to live in a better house or whatever. So here's my question for you. I was with my, I was talking to my coach. I have a coach yesterday. I'm talking to him and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. For me, it's like, I, I don't know if you had a point where you like, okay, now I can, I know I can exit. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times what happens is people, you know, really ambitious, successful people, they set these bars, mm -hmm. but the bar, they get close. And what, what do we naturally do? We raise the bar. Yep, exactly. Right. Yep. And, and we just keep raising it. Yeah. And we just, like I said, the hustle, the grind, it just, we just keep going. We keep going. Mm -hmm. You exited. Yeah. Like, and I mean, you've talked a little bit about it, but how did you know, like, because a lot of people, enough's never enough. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's like, a hard it, was thing. There, was there a certain amount or a certain, like, how did you? No, I mean, we've been financially independent. Like, dude, I saved my first million. I was 25, you know, so we've been financially independent a long time, you know, I've but yeah, our company went public. I was in the New York Stock Exchange twice on the floor. You know, so, so we've had some like cool sick. experiences, cool. right? And um, it wasn't necessarily. I mean, obviously, there's a dollar amount you have to have. But for me, I always had these dreams on the reason I was building a business, and one of those dreams, which it's crazy, just how God changes your journey. You know, yeah. I wanted to go sail around the world. I wanted to go see all these incredible places. So I bought this big boat and was getting my family ready. And then Kelsey started having health challenges. So then I started thinking like, oh, like my wife obviously is way more important than me chasing this thing. So yeah. that's what we sold the boat and then came back home. And then all these other things start popping up. Life starts happening, right? So then the person that made you successful, I don't think ever goes away. And Unfortunately, some people will try to drown it with substances or bad habits or those things, but that's not who I am. So I just knew, like, all right, what's next? You know, so I've just been doing a lot of big real estate projects and investing, helps people start some businesses and yeah. those kind of things. And that's kind of what I've done to keep my mind from going crazy, you know? Yeah, because I was, I was curious. Yeah. Like, you go from 100 miles per hour all yeah. the time mm -hmm. to, 
okay, like what's next? You yeah, know? it's also, dude, like my kids, like my son's nine, my daughter's seven, and then my youngest son's five. I've never missed anything, dude. I've been there, I mean, every so single sick. day of their lives. The first time they said a word, yeah. they crawled, they walked, they talked, the first baseball practice, best, I've everything. I've never missed anything. So good. So like they don't even, like, I mean, they've never seen me work even because even when I had the business, my my son was born in 2016, my oldest. You were, flex- you were flexible enough by that time. Yeah, it was, he was born in 2014. Yeah, and we were so like, dude, it was business was rocking. It was just, I just pretty much just did whatever I wanted. So if, I just brought him with me, you know? Yeah. And so you ask them, what did I do? Like, they know it's Primerica, but they didn't, they don't really have any idea what it is. You yeah. Know? That's so pretty cool. It's kind of interesting. Pretty cool that you're able to vamp up at such a young age and accomplish your goal so fast. Yeah, I mean, your kids are only young once, dude. And so, and I knew, like, so Kelsey always had this. It's funny because we, we got married. We never really even talked about, like, how many kids do we want? Yeah. When do we want? We never talked about that stuff, which I think is an important thing to talk about, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but we just didn't. We both had this, like, we got recruited into financial services young. We want, both wanted to be successful financially. And so... When I'm trying to think where I was going with that. Oh yeah. So, so I didn't, I said, I told her, I don't want to have kids till I'm 30. And she's like, what, why? And I'm like, well, I just want to be so set financially that by the time we have kids that I can do whatever I want. I can be there. If I want to go somewhere, we can take them. If they're learning about Egypt in school, we can just go to Egypt, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. That's cool. And so, you know, we, it was a goal for me and she's like, what, we're not going to have kids like soon, you know? And so I think people, they really need to think about, like, what do you want? Because you'll always figure out a way to get it if you know what you want. It's like one of my favorite quotes is by Mark Twain. He said, I can help enough people get what they want in life. The problem is I can't find anybody who knows what they want. And so how often do you talk to somebody and say, hey, do you have some goals? Do you have them written down? Pull them out. Let's see them. And rarely, you know, there was a study done by Harvard, and Harvard said that and this is Harvard. Yeah. So you go to all the graduates of Harvard, I, th- I think it was a 20-year study, and they went back and looked at all the careers of all these people and said, hey, uh, how many of you have goals written down, right? And it was like 2% of the crowd of people said, how many of them have them on you? And it was such a small number, but those people had earned like 90% more than all the graduates, 90% of all the income made in that entire graduating class were the couple of people that had their goals written down and on them. Yeah, Nate Ricks, he was a really successful business guy that yeah, passed away in the plane wreck. Yeah. yeah, right? And he, anyway, he said this and he preached this. He's like, it's a magic trick. He's yeah. like, write them down, see them daily, take daily action. Yes. It's like, it's a freaking magic trick. It is. And then it's, you still go and the percent of people that hear that and and don't do it. But it's the same thing like in our society today. It's like, it's like you know it's better to be in shape than be overweight, but the majority of men I see today walk around, they're overweight, and you go, yeah. why? It's not that hard to go to the gym for 45 minutes a day. Yeah, the percent of your day, I mean, that's small. Yeah, it's just mentally, it t- it's just hard for a minute. The same thing, it's just it a discipline. discipline. It takes discipline. And so the things that are easy to do are also easy not to do. And so I think it's so important. One of the keys to success is writing your goals down. First, you got to know what you want. Then you got to write yeah. them down every morning and write them down every night. So it becomes the most dominating thought in your mind because you'll That's always cool. figure out a way to make it happen. You know, oh, mine's powerful. All right, let's talk real estate. This okay. group, I love real estate. Yeah, these people want to hear real estate. Awesome. And it's funny. I was. I remember I ran into you at the soccer field. Their kids are playing soccer. And anyway, I think you you just met Darcy. Yeah. And you're talking about the power of networking, and then you're yep. like, dude, this guy, like, yeah, it's insane the amount of real estate. Yep. And yeah, you just, we just start talking real estate, and you're looking at these big deals. You're just talking about this project you met with an architect today. Mm-hmm. So you got some real estate, you know, under your belt. You got yeah. things in the works. And you talked about when you start, you, you basically retired, and then you start getting busy through real estate. Yep. So what, why real estate? I I don't know. I've I've always I've always invested my money. So I've I building my business and I think anybody should do this. One of the mistakes people make when they when it comes to investing is while they're building their business, you hear this thing like diversify. Yeah. 
which I think is important, but not while you're building a business, not while you're trying to, you've got to be obsessed about this thing. So anything, my, my thing was, I always wanted to invest my money, but I didn't want to invest in anything that took away any energy from me growing my business. And so for me, I knew that like indexed funds were easy. It was a passive. They've done really well great, for a lot of great years. Great advice. Like, yes, listen to this advice. Yeah. And so I just build my business, grow my income, invest in passive index funds. And so that way I don't have to think about it. Hands off. Yes. And, and I just, and I've made a ton of money from it. Right. Well, then when I have time and I have energy and I can use leverage and I have some money and I have some relationships, it's like, why wouldn't I do those things? Right. And then I learned, you know, you start learning. I'm a big reader. So I'm, you know, I'm always reading and, and I'm always trying to learn, like, what did this person do to become successful? What did this person do to become successful? Well, as I start reading books or networking or meeting other people, I realize, like, hey, there's some guys that really know what they're doing. And if I want to learn another aspect of investing, then I should probably get around some guys who have been mega successful doing that. Well, it just so happens that I live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of successful guys and made a lot of money in real estate. And it's like, I, I want to learn. So as I start asking questions, I start learning and it makes sense. I've got the time, energy, money. So let's do it. And then I learned like it takes, and I made some money in real estate it, it, prior to like going crazy with yeah. the last few years. I had made some money in real estate, right? Try to just make wise choices, buying at the right time, selling at the right time, which is not an easy thing to do. But it is if you're willing to be disciplined. Yeah. And so I started learning that it's just as easy to do a big deal of like 100 units as it is to do one. Like it doesn't take any different amount of energy. The only thing that changes is my belief and am I willing to accept that, you know? And so a lot of times people, when it comes to real estate, in my mind is people just have this low belief level and that's because they don't have any experience or they don't have the knowledge or, yeah. you know, someone to teach them. And help them understand. And so once I realized, like, man, it's it's just as easy to do 100 deals as it is one. You know, I could buy 100 doors or buy one door, and it's the same process. Same transaction, same yeah, everything. There, yeah. It doesn't take anything different. Yeah. It just takes guts, I guess, you know. So then when I realized, it's like, yeah, all right, wh why, would I, why am I not doing this when I have the time? And so I think that's kind of where it all started, you know. Nuggets, man, because you said first – you're surrounded by people. You put yourself in a position to be around yeah. people that are successful. Yeah. And then just hungry to learn. Yeah. I think it's important. I think a lot of times, I mean, I'm an introvert by nature, so I'm not like the guy who's going to, my wife is total social butterfly. Yeah. You know, we go to an event, she meet everybody, everyone. know their kids' names and all this kind of stuff. I can go to an event and, you know, I'll be totally fine never talking to anybody. I like being there. I like people, but it, it's not uncomfortable for me not to say a word, you know, but I also realize that if I'm not willing to network, if I'm not willing to build relationships, which is uncomfortable, then I can't expect to grow. Just like if I go to the gym and I don't get uncomfortable, I can't expect to grow. So yeah. if I go into a room like this or I'm in my neighborhood and I see somebody, if, if I don't start a conversation and shake their hands and do the uncomfortable thing, then I can't expect to grow. So the, a network is powerful, and I think it all starts relationships just with the willingness to put yourself out there and ask questions about other people because wow. then you can learn about And then it. you'll start learning people love to talk and people love to give knowledge they and do. give back. Mm -hmm. Like Successful people love it. Yeah. You've got to have the courage to get out and network. Yep. What, um, what advice would you give to a uh, – let's say there's a young hustler that, that wants to, to hustle, but, I mean, maybe they're just – they're currently working an hourly wage job to get by. Life's expensive, yeah. but they want to get into real estate. They want to make moves. They want to invest. What advice would you give this person that's working, I don't know, at McDonald's? Or and they're, some, and they're some, just some, wanting to just get into real estate? <clears throat> yeah, they're wanting to just make moves in life. Like they want to maybe, – maybe real estate sounds intriguing. They want to get ahead. They want financial freedom. Yeah, so I, th I think – What some, should they do? Yeah, somebody who's working – a job, right? Most people work 40 hours a week at a job. So yeah. 168 hours in a week. Yep. So there's 128 hours left over that you can do a lot of stuff with. And so my first piece of advice would be to, to understand that there's a lot more time available than you think you have, but you're wasting so much time doing non-productive things. 
So like one of the things I did early on in my business is I would work two full-time days. So I would wake up early and I would start work, you know, I'd get to the office early and then I would go work until about one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And then I would go to the gym and then I would work out and I'd take a shower and I get re-ready and I would go work till about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I did that every day. So I would work two full-time days. It's like an Ed Milet hack right there. He's talked about this. Yeah. Which is good. And so for me, it was always like, if, if the average person is working one and I'm working two, that compounds a lot. But most people, they get off work and they go, oh, I'm tired. Well, you know why you're tired? Because you don't have any passion for what you're doing. You're not excited about life. That's the only reason you're tired, right? And so you're tired because you're not chasing your goals. When you're chasing your goals and and you're passionate about where you're going, you have so much energy and people go, hey, slow down, take it easy. You wake up excited, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so I think you've got to find that. So if you're working a job, let's say nine to five, you get off at five o'clock, realize you've got between five and midnight, which is seven hours a day, every day, plus the weekends to start building skills or working on something else, right? If you want to be an entrepreneur or whatever it may be, I think the best place somebody should go to start making an income and learn the greatest skills they're going to learn in life is sales. I think everybody should learn sales and leadership. And the beauty about sales is a lot of times sales, if you get good at it, if it offers you the opportunity to grow into leadership positions. And I think leadership is the ultimate key because if you can learn how to lead people, you can accomplish anything you want in life, right? Why do you so, say that? Because any dream can be done, but not by yourself. And so if you can learn to get enough people work together to make that dream happen, but it takes a leader in order to get those people working together to make that dream happen. If you can't figure that out, then it's the dream's not going to happen, right? So you have to get people working together. And that's a leader. Oh, I was talking to my, I actually did a group call with some of my managers and, and sales reps today. And I was telling them very similar. I'm like, guys, you're good at sales. Like you should obsess with wanting to become a good leader. Yeah. Because it makes you better. Yep. Like you have to level up. Yeah. To inspire and get people to follow you. You have to be better. And as you start to recruit and lead, Oh, that's what it's all about. It is. And well, the hard part is most people have a hard time leading others because they don't lead themselves. And so this is why I think it's so important for somebody to get good at sales, not with an intention to be the greatest salesperson, but with an intention to get good so they can simplify it and duplicate it into others. Because if you can learn a skill set and you get so good at it that you can simplify it and help anybody understand it, now you can become a leader because you can help anybody understand this thing that is almost mythical to other people. Like if most people perceive sales as like, oh, this pushy guy who's trying to get yeah. me to buy something I don't want. That's not sales. That's that's an amateur. It's a guy who's trying to make money and take advantage of somebody. But a good salesperson is trying to solve a problem for the person in front of them and they have the tools to do it. And then they can help guide them through it. If they already had the solution to the problems, they wouldn't be sitting in front of them. Right. So if you can get good at sales and you can help people solve their problems in whatever that product or service is then you get good at that. You help these people solve their problems and then it becomes easy for you. So then it becomes repetitious. So then after you become really good at it and you start repeating the same thing over and over and over, you say the same things, the same stupid jokes, the same everything, and it works, then you can simplify and go, hey, here's exactly what I do and you can teach someone else to do it. You know, it's like Rockefeller has a saying, he says, I would rather have 1% of 100 people rather than 100% of myself. But you can't get 1% of 100 people until you've mastered it yourself because yeah. you can never actually duplicate that skill set. So it could happen to anything, but this is why I think it should be in sales first. So if I was saying if it was me, I was working at McDonald's, I wanted to get out of my job, I would spend morning, noon, and night. If I was at my job working at McDonald's, I would have an AirPod in, listening to podcasts, sales skills, sales training, so I could get good at that. And then at night, I would be applying those things I learned during the day. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I... That was so good. How, I, I love the two days. Guys could I go, the... How many of you guys could go out on a on a Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday and make more than they're making at their full time job? All, all of them. All of them. All of them. So the reason why the person doesn't get out of their job is not because they can't. It's because they haven't done what they need to do in order to make it happen. Yeah. And so they need an opportunity. They need the skill set, and they got to have the determination. Yeah, and the, the determination drive. and drive. Mm -hmm. No, I tell people that this the skill set of sales. It's obviously recession proof. Like I could walk across the street and go sell numbers on curbs mm -hmm. and I can go make a thousand dollars today. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Because I've developed the skill set. Yeah. And it's a need. Yeah. It's a need. 
And I think even more importantly you just, you just is, touched on it. is leadership. Yeah, because you learn once you learn how to sell, everybody needs to most companies' biggest problem is they don't have enough sales. If they could have more sales, then they would have more money. And if they had more money, they could grow the way they wanted to. So they need more sales. Well, they don't have the time and effort in order to train a bunch of new sales guys. Otherwise they would have done it. Right. So if you can get really good at sales and then teaching other people how to sell, you are indispensable, dude. That's is, the word. Yes. Because I tell guys, that's such a good word. I tell guys, I'm like, imagine getting, like, how many really good salespeople do you know? Like, there's not a there's lot. There's not of, that many. No. But there's not a lot of really good people in anything because most people, they don't put the effort they really need to be great at almost anything. It's whether it's They're a just marriages, not willing to do what it takes. Parents, yes, yeah. because it just takes discipline and it's not hard. And I think the problem with social media today is you have all these guys just trying to create all this content and all this stuff rather than helping them realize it's not that hard to separate yourself from the masses. It's not. All you have to do is a few simple daily disciplines repeated every single day over and over and over and over, and eventually you beat everybody. And yeah, then if I, you can just teach those people those simple fundamentals, then you can build yeah, a business. I hear this stat, and I don't know if it's like an actual stat, but it's like if you want to be in the top 10%, that's what you got to do. That's all you got to yeah. do. Mm -hmm. You just show up and get good and be disciplined and just keep showing up. Yeah. And keep working it. And then you're in the top 10%. Dude, I think you get in the top 1%. No, so you probably do. Like, get in the top 1%, then you just are more, I mean, you just self-analyze. Yeah. And you do what we were talking about before, right? Like, you Absolutely. actually take a step back. That's good. What would you, I guess before this question, do you have any, like, obviously you had Brandon really mentor you, but is there mm -hmm. any, like, mantras or, like, lessons that have stuck with you that have, like, that, that have helped you get through the hard times or sayings or things yeah, I mean, that like, cause there's lows and you're, when you're an entrepreneur and there's sales, yeah, like, there's I, a lot of lows, right? Yeah. I don't know about a lot. So I think that when there are downtimes, so like we moved from St. George to Boise and it was tough. It was not easy. And then we started getting comfortable. You know, we were, we were doing really well. We were cash millionaires. And so we chose to move to Las Vegas and start all over and do it again putting ourselves back in that creative stage. So I've always called it the creative stage. It's cool. So I think the creative stage is crucial. So most people think like that's depression or they're down and out or they're beating themselves up. I just call it ambition. So I think that feeling that most people feel where it's a low, that's not a low, right? The, the time you should be scared is if you don't have that feeling because if you're okay with losing, then there's something wrong. But if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's ambition. You want to win. You want to succeed. So that's a good thing. So you got to reframe. The lows are good things. Yes, you got to reframe it. And oh. so you don't learn anything from being at a peak. You don't learn anything from being at the top. No, Nobody ever talks about, hey, this is why you should get here and stay here. But, you know, it's like I used to joke around and say, have you ever read Paris Hilton's autobiography? No, nobody ever has because it's like started rich, still rich. Yep, still rich. Yep, finished rich. <laughs> like nobody cares about that story. Yeah. You know, it's awesome. I, I'm, I love that she gets to live that life. I want my kids to live that life. But it's not an inspiring story. We get inspired by stories like Rudy or by Rocky where someone gets knocked down and gets back up. Why? Because we can relate to that, right? And it's this ambition inside of us when somebody watches a movie like that and they get excited about the potential for their future. That's the key to success. And so once you have that, it's not the lows that, that are bad times. Those are the times that offer you the ability to grow. So if you're having a down moment right now, stop telling yourself it's a down moment. It's not. You have ambition and you're sick and tired of losing and it's time to go win. So what are you not doing that is stopping you from winning? What is stopping you from being number one? Because you can even get to number one. You've had guys get to number one. Yeah. The hard part is staying there right? And continuously doing those things over and over because eventually it gets comfortable and you got to be willing to stay uncomfortable in order to do incredible things, right? It's like, there's a great book uh, from Jim Collins called From Good to Great, right? A lot of people do things to become good, but very few people do things to become great because once you start winning, it takes this like sickening obsession to keep doing those things over and over. These, this is why we idolize guys like Kobe and Michael Jordan and LeBron James. They win over and over and over again, but there's not very many people that do that. Yeah. Why? Because during those down moments, you think Kobe didn't have down moments? You think Michael Jordan didn't have down moments? Right? You read about Michael Jordan, he had a lot of them. He had a lot of tough times. 
And he even went to go play baseball for a while. Maybe, hey, should I do this? Yeah. But during those times of reflection, he wasn't thinking, oh, I'm not good enough or I can't do it. He was thinking, what? What do I got to do to get back on Just top opportunity. again? opportunity. Yeah, what do I got to do to get back on top again? So I think for me, man, anytime I was having – I wasn't having the best month or I wasn't having the best year. I was just always planning about, all right, here's what I've got to do. I know what I've got to do. I can only control one thing, and that's what I do today. And so if I do that every day and I do it long enough, eventually I'm going to beat everybody around me. That's you know? good. Yeah, Kobe Kobe talks about his losses. He he lo- like he loved – that's where he learned. He yeah. loved – like losing is part of the game, obviously, Yeah, where some people get pissed and pout and – well, he, he's different. Like, yeah, he was different. He, he looked at it like, okay. I mean, you just touched on all of it. Yeah. He would, you know, point the finger back at himself and say, opportunity to learn. Yeah. What do I got to do to get what better? What do I got to do to get better? Yeah, because somebody else was doing those things. And they might have done it to beat you, but that doesn't mean they're going to stay doing those things. So if you're willing to go do them and then keep doing them, but you wouldn't have known you had to keep doing them without falling and then going, oh, dude, I got to do it again. And these are times where, like, I had to manufacture that in my life. Like, I had created this life that was so good that I'm like, all right, we got to move. Like, I've got to move to a whole new city, start shaking hands. You know, like, I, I was I was a multimillionaire dude, moved to Las Vegas, and I would get gas and go, hey, excuse me, can I ask you a question, you know? And I was shaking dudes' hands, just, and they were skeptical. What did, what did you call it again? You were, Prospecting? Uh, no, no, not prospecting. When you, when you move to shake things up, you call it... Um, I don't know. To put what yourself to put yourself back through like the I don't know. Oh, uh, but uh, I, I don't know what, what I you said. said. But it's so good. Man. I don't know, good. but I just know that I've got to continue to be uncomfortable. Yeah. If you start getting comfortable, that's that's where things get scary. And I think a lot of times, I've said this so many times, like the worst place I think we can raise children is in middle class America. Because it was never that bad, but it was never that good. And a lot of middle class kids become middle class parents. But you see a lot of success stories of people that were broke and became wealthy, and you see a lot of success stories of people that were wealthy and raised wealthy children. The reason why is because of expectations. If they're wealthy, they taught their kids those things. Here's what you do. You become an entrepreneur. But if they were broke, they go, I'm so sick and tired of being broke. I'm going to do something to change my situation. And so these are why you hear a lot of those stories. But rarely do you hear a story of someone who's raised middle class and broke out. Yeah, I look at a lot of my – a lot of sales reps that I – that I work with that grew up middle class or people that I'm recruiting that mm-hmm. are in the middle class. Yeah. They just don't, they don't get it. They, yeah. can't, they don't see it. It's just how they were raised. Yep. Right. It's how they were raised. Like I say that's people you're recruiting. You want to poor, smart and hungry. Yeah. You know, like they're poor, they know it and they're hungry for more. You know, if you can find those people, then they're willing to do whatever it takes, you know, and you just have to have this hunger. It's like even for my kids, you know, I'm like always thinking like, what can I do to give them the hunger that I had growing up? And I think that's why like fitness or sports or these things, the mentality, teaching them these lessons, they're the things that are important to keep that hunger in my kids. Like, hey, discipline, you beat everybody. You know, it just takes discipline. You just got to have the hunger, though, that when everybody else is done with practice, you keep going. Yep. Right. When you wake up in the morning, you're obsessed about whatever it is you're trying to accomplish because they're not. I know you think they are, but they're not. And if you'll take that moment to just set yourself a little bit further ahead today and you do it tomorrow and you do it tomorrow, when you show up, you almost go like, wow, did none of these people prepare? No, they thought they were preparing, but you were obsessed. So good. Yeah. What would you lend with this? What what question or what uh, what would you tell yourself? if you could go back to your 18 year old self, is there any, a piece of advice that you would give, give your 18 year old self? Man, that's a good question. God's the one in control, not you. That's probably what I would tell myself. I think, man, when I was, when I was young and wanting to succeed so bad, it's like, man, I just, I just want to win. I'm willing to do whatever it takes And it was like, there's times where I look back in my career and I'm like almost embarrassed about how obsessed I was. I would be like, I would be a jerk to people because they would say something that offended me. And I'm just, you know, like, hey, dude, take it easy. Like I would get so offended if someone told me to take it easy. Like you take it easy. You're freaking (laughs) broke, man. I'm trying to be successful here, you know. But a lot of times I think those situations happen as I look back on those and maybe I burned some relationships or I did things I'm not proud of by the way I treated people, really most of it came to that because of my response to people's 
average comments, which frustrated the heck out of me. It, like, it, it would almost make me feel like, man, I got to get away, you know, and I didn't need to. I needed to be a leader to help them change their thinking. But in order to do that, I had to have some empathy for their situation. But I didn't because I was so focused on mine, but I was just trying to control the outcome. But if I look back and know that, hey, I can be tough on myself and still be lenient with others, and then my example is what's going to help other people want to be influenced. And I'm not in control of the outcome. You know, if it's easy to reverse engineer and go look back into my life and go, hey, this happened, this happened, this happened. But if I try to do it forward, it's a miracle. It's like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that actually happened. Like I met this person who introduced me to this person who introduced me to that person. And then this happened. And yeah. then this happened. It's a miracle. And this is why business plans never work, right? Anybody who's been in business, you created a business plan. It doesn't ever work. It never goes like that. Yeah, it doesn't go as Because planned. God's in control, not us. So I think if I could tell myself that, like, hey, work hard and God's in control and it's all going to be okay, then I think I would have, early on in my career, I would have had a sense of uh, security that I was always seeking, you know? Yeah. And I think the older I got and the wiser I got, the more I realized, like, hey, I can't control if you want to win or not. There's nothing I can do. All I can do is be a good example, work hard, have great skills, save my money, treat my family good, be a good member of my community, do what I'm supposed to do. And if that's who you want to be, then I'm going to attract you. But sitting there trying to talk oh, someone into it. me up. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to talk people into wanting to be like me, but they didn't want to. Yeah. And it's so frustrating. Yeah, my CEO, I, recently I had this experience. My CEO literally just said majority of things that you just said. Um, but I had this sales rep, and he was doing all this crazy crap. And I'm like, dude, let's just freaking fire him. Like, mm -hmm. I'm pissed off. Yeah. Like, I'm fired up. Like, let's get him out of here. Yeah. And my CEO said, Mitch, he's like, you need to lead him. Yeah. Like, go lead him. It could be to rehab, right? Yeah. But go empathize. Go get on his level and be a leader. Yeah. Like, lead him. And it really stuck with me. That's awesome. Yeah, I think sometimes it's just we we want to control the outcome so much because we want to win so bad. Yeah, we think that if we control other people, we control that outcome, but it's just not how it works, you know. So it's an it's an interesting thing in leadership roles, realizing that if if we just do great things and we have some empathy and we can be tough on ourselves and not have to be tough on others. How much Dude, better I love people that you respond said that. to that, you know? Like, learn to be tough on yourself, but lean it with others. Yeah. I think that... And you start to realize better. not many are cut from, you know, our cloth. Well, and not only like, that, like, do they that's have... That's where I started to realize, like, they just don't have the drive or maybe not the vision. And, and you don't okay. need them to. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's like, I just had this conversation with somebody recently. It was like, man, I'm just looking for the top sales guys. And I go, dude... That's good. We all want the best sales guys. Like that's how you build a great company. But you don't build a great company with the best sales guys with your whole message is only for the best sales guys. Otherwise, you miss out on all the guys who just want to make a hundred grand a year. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're gonna have guys make millions a year, right? But if your whole focus is on only only the guys that make millions, you miss out on all the guys. And 80% of your business is gonna come from these dudes that make a hundred or two hundred. Yeah. And so do you want to build a business for these 100 or 200? And then the winners automatically think, that's all that guy makes? Dude, I'm going to crush it here. He thinks that anyway. So whether you build a business for him or not, he's going to go get what he wants out of it. And so I think it's important as a leader we remember that our job is just to build a great environment where people can come and achieve their goals and dreams regardless of what it is they want. Our job as a leader isn't to change what they want. It's to help them get what they want. And if we can do that, then, and our people achieve what they want, then they've had success. And if our people are having success, then so are we. If we're the only people having any kind of success, that's not a successful leader, just a successful individual, you know? Jeff, you're a wise man. I need you to come speak to my sales group, man. Anytime, bro. Oh, I would love that. Yeah. So any other words of advice you'd like to, to give? No, man. I just hope that, you know, hopefully that people can get something from today and use it and get inspired and go take their lives to the next level. It's so worth it, man. I think that... Yeah, here's a, here's a question. That, yeah. We'll end with this. Was it worth it? Like all that sacrifice, right? All that, the discipline, the grind. Yeah. I, and you I just mean, said it. It's so worth it. There's nothing, there are not words in the English language to describe how worth it it is. Like they're not, you can't, the, the words don't exist to describe the feeling you get from achieving your dream life and knowing that it's you've done it. You know, there's just no words to describe it. 
And until, and this is why I think that a lot of times people have won big, they're like screaming and shouting from their rooftops, trying to get people to pay attention is because now they realize like, oh my gosh, it is this good. You know, it's just better than you can imagine. And so I kind of enliken it to, you know, when you're a little kid and, and I, for years, dude, I would try to figure out like, how can I help describe the feeling of winning? Cause it's hard to describe like, what does winning feel like? Is it, is it a big house? Is it a nice car? What if you don't care about houses or cars? Yeah. Right? Like, what is it? And so, you know, it's like, remember when you're a little kid, man, you're like five, six, seven or eight. And, you know, someone say, what do you want to do for a living when you get older? And they go, I want to be an astronaut or I want to be the president <laughs> yeah. or I want to be a veterinarian or whatever it is. They never once thought about money. And the reason why is all their basic needs were taken care of. They were their housing. We, when we get to high school and we start realizing our social status matters, what kind of car someone drives, what kind yep. of shoes they wear, and then we get into college or we start having a life and we go, oh my gosh, man, I, I'm going to college. I need a part-time job. And then all of a sudden, maybe their wife's pregnant. Now, you know, now I'm not going to be able to go to college. I'm going to have to get a full-time job. And then, and then life hits them. And the next thing you know, they're 40. And they forget, like, remember that childlike enthusiasm you had when you were seven or eight? What was the difference between then and now? Was it what you wanted to do? No, it wasn't what you wanted to do for a living. That had nothing to do with it because if it really was, you would be that thing. It was just the thought of chasing something that you could get excited about every single day. Oh. It was just this thought that like, man, I could be something. You really believed that you could be anything. Yeah. And as we get older, we start doubting ourselves. We start comparing ourselves to other people around us that gave up, that quit on their dreams. We have people tell us, oh, you're not good enough or you're too fat or you're not this or you're not that or you're wrong this. And then we just start believing them a little bit. You settle. What if you could take all that away and and you could go back to that childlike enthusiasm? You don't have to worry about bills. You don't have to, you just worried about what were you going to do tonight? What were you going to do this weekend? You're going to hang out with your friends. You eat when you're hungry, right? You're excited for Christmas. I think that feeling is what achieving your dream feels like. But as an adult, it's like, that's pretty man. bad. You know, it's just, it's this feeling that's really hard to explain, but that's the best way that I can explain how winning feels like. It's just like, man, I did it. And so as hard as it is, it's really not that hard because I would have done it a thousand times over, dude. You know, if knowing what I know now, yeah. I would have done it a thousand times over. And I, I think that if people realize that through the journey, but it's always easier said than done. You know, when you're in the middle of the journey, you're like, dude, this yeah, hurts and it sucks hurts. and it feels like it's going to take forever but it's not going to take forever. It's going to take forever if you keep stopping and keep starting and keep stopping and keep starting. Then it will take forever yep. and it may never happen. But if you just commit and you just do the things we talked about today, you write down your goals, you work on your skills, you get good with people, you get good at sales, stay you get out good and be at leadership. Patient, man. That's what I tell people. Stay out and you know, be patient and keep grinding. It'll man. happen. That's and cool. It's going to be better than you imagine. What, uh, if someone wants to follow you on, on social media, yeah, what do they um, do? Instagram, uh, that's where I'm at mostly. Yeah. Um, it's at Mr. Underscore Fieldstead, Mr. Fieldstead. And then uh, we have a solid podcast. So the podcast is called Solid, S-O-L-I-D, yep, Solid. Solid. Look it up. Yeah, on Instagram, it's Solid Podcast on YouTube. Or you guys have any. some cool speakers, some cool guests. Thank you, man. I appreciate yeah, that. We've I, had, love, I love it. You've been one of them, dude. I know, we, I you did of, such a good job, I man. love your podcast. So, thank you, dude. Really We've cool guests. Such a good time doing it, and uh, it, it's just been fun. So I hope people yeah. get a lot out of it. Cool. Well, appreciate you coming on. Thanks, man. Appreciate yep. you having me.